Hi, I'm Charles with Anycap. This is my recap for the 2023 anime called Kingdom of Ruin. If you like my recaps, please consider subscribing. The story begins as we are told that God created humanity and then he created witches. God, being much nicer than I would be, shared his power with the witches and told them that in his place, they shall guide the powerless humans. The witches agreed and swore to dedicate themselves to helping humans in the name of friendship. However, in the present day, things have taken a horrific turn. A scene shows a large group of ungrateful humans preparing to execute a witch as they scream that they don't need witches and they should be eradicated. The witch hopes that they will all die, but she beats them to it. Elsewhere, our protagonist named Adonis, who is a witch's apprentice, complains about how tired his legs are and how it's way too hot, which makes sense since it's a desert. Adonis grows frustrated since the witch he travels with named Chloe isn't listening and interrupts him to tell him to quiet down. Adonis wants her to at least use magic to check their location since it would be a lot cooler than using an old school map, but she calls him an idiot and reminds the boy that magic isn't that cheap. The map lover threatens to leave him behind and gets even more upset when Adonis just uses a device to determine where they are. Little Miss Hates Technology is furious since she told him numerous times to not use that weird machine since the people looking for them will use it to find them. Adonis calms her down by explaining that it's not a weird device. It's actually a smartphone and he made this one himself so it can't be used to track them. Our proud little nerd explains that his device uses freeform summoning magic to replace its radio waves with multidimensional photons, so not even the army's triangulation technology can find them. And it doesn't need batteries. The technological genius points out that using maps in this day and age is pretty lame, but Chloe is not impressed. Princess Stuck in Her Ways says that they are ready to move again, but Adonis has gotten very serious, and he asks her why they have to keep running. Chloe explains that it's because she is a witch, and attitudes towards witches have changed. Now, simply living is a struggle. Blending in when in human cities, living away from human towns. If anything, she is more like a ninja than a witch. Unfortunately, her terrible joke doesn't land, so the two pretend it didn't happen and just keep moving. During their journey, Chloe reminds him that they need to find a place that's tolerant towards witches so they can reclaim their peaceful, happy life. They also need to find a school for him to attend, but our brilliant little technology lover surprisingly explains that school sucks and he'd rather keep studying under her. Chloe inappropriately teases him about liking older women and the two move on. Adonis can't help but wonder why Chloe isn't frustrated. He hates the Red Empire that they reside in and the evil little dude desperately wants to eradicate humans using magic. Just then, Adonis senses something approaching, and a group of soldiers report back to their headquarters that they have spotted a fugitive witch. Adonis fearlessly states that he will handle the human scum, but Chloe stops him and explains that he is far too inexperienced. Chloe, who better have something good up her sleeve after holding our boy back like that, starts off with some ice magic as a staff appears in her hand. She sighs while stating that humans never learn and unleashes her spell. Elsewhere, a man just like my accountant apologizes to Emperor Goeth. The Emperor, with a mustache looking like a masterpiece of grooming, calls him an incompetent fool, but the suit explains that Chloe is a high-ranking witch who uses ice magic. He tries to explain that a single squadron isn't enough to defeat her, but someone's foot comes flying out of nowhere to silence him. My accountant is told to learn his place, but he explains that he wasn't doing anything wrong. The Emperor silences everyone and just instructs them to bring Chloe to him immediately, as he refuses to let her escape. Back to the fight, Chloe's in the coolest pose she can make and we see that she is exhausted after defeating the hopelessly weak humans. Adonis isn't saying anything though and is furious that Chloe always holds him back. He exclaims that he can use spells and wonders why she won't let him fight. Adonis thinks he could have handled those measly wimps easily. He doesn't see the point in studying magic if she won't let him use it. Miss interrupts a lot, interrupts our boy again and reiterates that he is just too inexperienced with magic. This crazy kid then interrupts her by bringing down a massive sword straight down from the heavens and asking her how could a student of hers be considered inexperienced. Chloe doesn't even address the good point he just made and simply tells him that if he whines too much she will get mad. However, Adonis has come to a conclusion and assumes that she must be treating him this way because he is a human like them. He believes that she doesn't want him to kill his own kind because she is too nice. Because of this, no matter how much they mistreat her, she suppresses her emotions so he won't fight humans, and she never allows him to fight them. Adonis is at his limit though, and he can't stand not being able to protect her anymore. He tries to express his feelings, but she stops him, and just tells him that she feels the same way. As they embrace, one of the humans turned popsicle sticks has a device that confirms their location. Just then, our duo begins to float, and Chloe is shocked to realize that humans must have completed something. 
She points out that not even witches can achieve long-distance physical travel, but that seems to be what's happening. The ever-heroic Adonis tells her that things will be okay, and he will always be by her side. A look into space shows some pretty out-of-place technology. It's a space station, and the people aboard explain that the transfer is so far a success. The drop-off coordinates are set, and a transfer countdown begins. Back on Earth, Emperor Goeth gives a speech. He removes his crown so the peasant people can relate to him more, and he starts off by saying that he's speaking to them not as their emperor, but as a human being. The emperor, sporting the coolest mustache around, points out that mankind has always been protected by magic. Whenever natural disasters or plagues occurred, they depended on witches, expressed their gratitude for them, revered them, and feared them, due to their power exceeding human knowledge known as magic. Emperor Goeth believes this to be unjust. He states that humans are not just weaklings who must bow to the whims of the witches and beg for their assistance. Goeth, who could probably convince a cat to buy a dog with his speech skills, tells them to behold mankind's creations. Their countless airships fly through the sky and their metropolis fears no storm. The automatic trains driving through their cities will open up new frontiers. And in their hands, they hold the fruit of their wisdom, the smartphone, a device that can be used to play sweet games and watch any cat videos. He tells them that humans are not weak. Even without magic, they can mold the natural world and control it with their own strength. Goeth, with smooth talk so good he could sell ketchup as tomato smoothies, tells his people that now is the time to eradicate witches and show the world that they are its supreme rulers. Some random girl compliments the genocidal maniac on his fantastic murder speech, and he states that the world will surely move in a positive direction once the witches are eradicated. Just then, a beam of light strikes the stage, and we see that Adonis and Chloe have been teleported. The two can't believe the terrible things that the crowd is saying to them and become angry when they see that it was Emperor Goeth that brought them. The ever valiant Adonis instantly springs to action, telling Chloe to run so he can buy her time to escape. He gets stopped pretty fast though, and Goeth is disgusted to see that this human boy has been raised by a witch. We then see that Chloe isn't just some annoying interrupter, as she becomes enraged and tells Goeth that if he values the lives of his people, then he needs to let go of her young apprentice. Not one to make empty threats, Chloe begins a powerful Absolute Zero Ice Magic spell, and determines that Goeth's silence is his answer. Something big is coming, so Chloe speaks to the citizens. She states that they are humans just like Adonis, so she didn't want to fight them. If she were to destroy them, Adonis wouldn't have a home to return to. This is why she has allowed them to live up to this point. However, they are proving themselves to be too dangerous, and she begins her spell. Unfortunately, she's utterly shocked to see that her magic just stops. Goeth, with his impeccable stash, explains that she cannot understand the power of science humans have acquired. We see the magic photon suppression device that nullified her magic, and the humans in the crowd have a good laugh like they actually did something themselves. As if proud, Goeth expresses his doubt that she even considered that the human she once helped would someday chase her down. Adonis, never willing to give up as our brave protagonist, tries to use his pen, but can't understand why his magic isn't working. Goeth explains that it's time for witches like Chloe to hand over the world, and backhands her right in the face. As if that weren't bad enough, she is also completely exposed, and the crowd begins to take pictures. Adonis is furious to see his teacher humiliated and vows to kill them all, but is once again stopped. He keeps trying, but all he can do is tell her to wait for him, and soon he will be right by her side again. Goeth has had enough of the boy and orders that the boy be shot in the head. Chloe completely changes her defiant attitude to save our boy, and bows to the Emperor. She takes all the blame and explains that the boy has nothing to do with it. He is like them, a human. She lies by saying that she kidnapped him and raised him as her slave. He is a poor, miserable human boy. Completely out of character, Chloe begs and pleads that the Emperor have mercy on him and she doesn't care what happens to her. Adonis is in absolute disbelief when she offers to be a slave. With frenzied fury, he writes wildly on the ground, every ounce of sanity seemingly abandoned as he swears to kill them all. Goeth, uninterested in her offer, points a gun at her. Chloe, realizing what is about to happen, calmly calls out to Adonis and thanks him for everything. We get a quick glimpse into when they first met. Chloe took in the homeless, angry little kid and tells him now that she is glad that they met. She begins to say the words I love you, but before she can finish, the cold-blooded Goeth ends her life. Adonis, frozen in horror, is mortified, and before her body can even hit the ground, Goeth's soldiers follow up his shot with a barrage of bullets. Adonis begs for them to stop, but they are relentless. Their life together flashes before Chloe's eyes, and she thinks about how she was truly, truly happy. The crowd cheers with utter jubilation, and Goeth finalizes her death by having her head cut off. 
We then learn the rest of what God said when he shared his power with the witches. He told the witches that the humans may fear them as they are timid. He hoped that they would become friends and bring eternal peace to the world. However, should they hate one another and fight, then may the darkness of chaos envelop the world. With Chloe dead and Adonis consumed by a raging fury, the real story can now begin. We move forward 10 years. A couple of prisoners are arguing over some food, but a girl named Daroka offers them her food so they can stop. One of the rude girls takes her offer, but Daroka's friend Anna points out that Daroka gave someone else her food earlier. Daroka keeps her spirits up though, and shows how much energy she still has with the strange dance. Anna points out that no matter how much technology advances thanks to the gear expansion, people keep fighting among themselves. The wars never stopped. She remembers being told that humanity would be happy once the witches were gone, but that hasn't come true yet. Anna, always staying positive, lightens the mood with some expert level puppeteering. Through her puppeteering act, we learn that they are prisoners because they lost to the Empire. Daroka uses the puppet to assure Anna that everything will be okay. Just then, soldiers arrive to call prisoner number 218. Others gossip about how those that get called never come back, and Anna is terrified when she realizes that she is number 218. The soldiers demand that the prisoners speak up, and Daroka fearlessly steps forward. Daroka is taken away, leaving Anna in complete disbelief since that was her number. And as if that wasn't dramatic enough, we see that Daroka left her puppets behind with their number. Daroka is taken to a place where she finds that she will serve as a slave. She sees what happens to those that refuse, and the flamboyantly dressed warden explains that she needs to serve the Empire just like everyone else. He states that running the prison costs money, taxpayers money, the blood tax of the Empire's people. He asks her who brought about the gear expansion and the explosive rise of human civilization, who used their scientific and military might to defeat the witches and seize dignity for humanity. He answers his own question by stating that it was them, the Redia Empire. He is sure that she will fetch a good price and takes a selfie with her, but instantly regrets it when she bites his finger. Daroka makes an attempt at an escape and tries to open all the cells using the warden's phone. Unfortunately, their technology has voice authentication. She tries to ask it nicely, but that doesn't work, so she does her best impression of the warden. Luckily, her feminine voice is pretty similar to the flamboyant warden and it works. She tells all the prisoners to run and with that, chaos ensues. Amidst the chaos, Daroka heads to a very special cell made especially for a very powerful person. Daroka is taken down, but the soldiers point out that all cells are opening and they are in very big trouble. Just then, alarms begin to sound and the chamber begins to open. The guards panic with fear and we see that it's the overwhelmingly angry Adonis. The guards tremble in fear and Adonis, with unparalleled anger, breaks free from his shackles. With fear in his voice, one of the guards points out that prisoner 1001 is free and he wants to report it to the chief. There is no time though, so they make the incredibly wrong decision to try and put him back in the chamber. These hopeless fools think it will help if they all go in at once, but Adonis instantly eliminates one of them. Without a single word or wasted movement, Adonis expertly finishes off the other two. Daroka, probably wishing she still had her puppets, is terrified out of her mind, and Adonis begins to approach her. She begs Adonis not to do anything, but immeasurable anger courses through him, and it's as if words can't reach him. He fires a shot at her, but we see that he's somehow able to still be merciful, as he only shot her chains. An announcement is made to all the guards in the prison, warning that all cell doors and corridor partitions have been opened. Elsewhere, Director Yamato, whose earlobes could probably be seen from space, tells a blonde guy to handle the situation at the prison, and gives him permission to arm himself with weapons greater than Class 5. This guy speaks far too casually for Vice Director Yuki's liking, and is sent on his way. Yuki promises to kill that blonde boy eventually, but Yamato warns against it, as he is a high-ranking executive just like her. Director Pancake for Earlobes is confident in the guy's abilities, but knows that the prison is quite dangerous. At the prison, the chaos continues and it is reported to the warden that even the confiscated item storage has been open. He can't believe that Daroka managed to crack his phone's voice authentication system and is deeply frustrated by her choice to free the one person they couldn't afford to let escape. Elsewhere, we see Adonis atop a building. He tests his powers by firing a bullet and uses one of his written style summoning spells called Gain. Adonis, clearly with only one goal in mind, exclaims that it's now time to end every last citizen. Back at the prison, Blonde Boy, whose real name is Eek Out, reports that he has searched the entire internment camp but found no signs of the boy. We see that taking care of the situation actually meant eliminating all the prisoners, and he learns that a building was struck by a massive shell. 
He will head there as soon as possible, but decides that he needs to clean up the cause of the mess first. Back in the city, Daroka is completely distraught. She blames herself for the catastrophe that's to come since she couldn't stop Adonis. Nearby, Adonis roams the city, and we see that his destructive behavior has made the news. It reports that a massive artillery shell-like object was fired into a building. The extent of the damage is unclear, but it could be an attack by neighboring nations. Adonis continues to roam as he thinks about how Chloe would not praise him for what he's about to do. He imagines what she would say, emphasizing that getting revenge won't bring her back to life. He managed to escape, so she will want him to just go enjoy his life. Adonis is able to find just a tiny bit of comfort from these words, but some belligerent jerks, who probably deserve what's coming to them, call him a creep when they see him talking to himself. Adonis acknowledges that 10 years have passed since Chloe's death, but no matter how much time passes, he will never forget what happened. The look in her eyes, her voice, the words when she told him she loved him. He states that he loved her too, just as he starts using his written style summoning magic. The earth shakes beneath the city, and this time, Adonis has summoned a giant. Nearby, the police don't believe callers that are calling about a giant, but they quickly realize that something is wrong when a car comes crashing into their building. The driver is terrified of something huge, but the cops, doing what they do best, don't believe him either, and this brilliant detective, that probably deserves a raise, determines that the driver is just drugged out of his mind, and they should just arrest him. Sherlock calls the narcotics division, but quickly realizes his mistake when he actually sees the giant. The giant is doing immense damage to the city, leaving people in peril. Adonis then makes his way to the center of the city, as he exclaims that Emperor Goeth better not try to run. By the Emperor, Yamato is informed of the giant robot. It's passing through the business district and heading their way. They are unable to stop it and all attempts to reach the Emperor have failed, but the Queen has informed them that he is not well. Director Earlobes declares a state of emergency. He requests air ground support from all available aircrafts and orders that all armored foot soldiers be sent as well. Yamato marvels at the giant robot and is informed that the boy and his quill have gone missing from the prison, making it clear that the giant must be powered by magic. This makes things much simpler for the pair of earlobes with a body attached to them as this means they only need to activate their magic photon suppression device. With the extermination of all witches, the device was put in underground storage and it's uncertain if the 10 year old device will work properly. Yamato leaves the issue of national importance in the hands of Yuki, and with that, the national state of emergency is declared. The giant continues its rampage, and we see that Adonis' rage spares no lives. Some tanks arrive, hoping to end the catastrophe, but their attacks miss badly. For some unknown reason, their shells won't fly straight. Adonis calls them scum as he makes a demand for their lives, and has the giant punch a building with such sheer force that its debris destroys the tanks. Yuki can clearly tell from the massive destruction that Adonis' 10 years in confinement were spent meaningfully. It turned out to be a simulation in its mind without limits. Scientific research conducted within the mind. The ultimate environment to determine the most precise way to slaughter a nation. As Adonis continues his rampage, Yuki explains that the only way for a non-witch to use magic is through written style summoning magic. It is the practice of understanding and systematizing the mechanisms of magic and converting them into mathematical expressions using a special quill. However, mastering it wouldn't have been easy without such an excellent teacher. Right now, for Adonis, there's no difference between those who were present 10 years ago and those who weren't. Adonis is relentless in his attack. He states that if killing Chloe was humanity's great purpose, then everyone who lives in the country and reaps the benefits is just as guilty. Adonis then demonstrates his incredible power to summon anything at will, and summons some giant gatling guns called the Bullet Bell. Our revenge-seeking protagonist is determined to make things right as he wants to exchange an eye for an eye. He does just as the humans did to his teacher and sprays bullets down on a large crowd. The young man that we saw 10 years ago has clearly been driven to the absolute edge. With tear-filled eyes and without any semblance of sanity left, he looks to the sky, finding a bone-chilling beauty in the aftermath of his rampage. However, something isn't quite right. Clearly disappointed and still distraught, Adonis wishes he could feel better about things. Nearby, we see that Ikao is watching, and he is told that the spellcaster is in the palm of the giant's hand. All forces are told that their target is long-term prisoner, the witch's apprentice, Adonis. The assault on the giant starts with a group of fighter jets. They bombard the giant with several missiles, forcing Adonis off of it. With reckless abandon, missiles continue to rain down, putting civilians at great risk. A building is about to turn a very recently orphaned child into a pancake, but Daroka appears out of nowhere to save him. She leaves the kid with a stranger and explains that she is on her way to stop Adonis. 
On top of a nearby building, Adonis determines that he's out of shape, and soldiers begin to descend on him. Back at the Imperial Castle, we see that while Emperor Goeth managed to maintain his impeccable mustache, he was not able to maintain his health. He is severely ill, so the Queen tells him not to worry about anything, and their empire will be just fine. She tells him to rest and assures that he did a great job as Emperor in making sure the empire would be strong. The Emperor of Simpery credits the Queen for staying by his side and giving him the strength to do what he does. However, he coughs with enough intensity that it could probably dislodge all his internal organs, and we learn that he has an incurable disease. This absolute alpha male with a mountain of testosterone tells him that he needs no doctor since he is totally fine, even though he is casually holding a palmful of his own blood. Goeth begins to wonder if his illness is a curse from God himself. It doesn't matter though, he refuses to repent. They built a hyper-scientific civilization and burned their neighbors, the witches, for the sake of progress. The world and humanity could never advance as long as witches were around. As he gives his little self-assuring speech, we see that Adonis doesn't need any words and continues reducing the population. Goeth continues to explain that humanity must carve its own path alone. The new age has no need for magic and if anything, magic would only get in its way. There is one thing he is certain of and that is that he did the right thing. It begins to rain and Goeth shows that his mustache isn't the only smooth thing about him, as he tells his queen that she is a flower that blossomed on the path of carnage. Elsewhere, Yamato is shocked to hear with his ears that their elite unit has been wiped out. However, what's even more startling is that a civilian is now approaching the target. We then watch as Adonis chokes out a soldier, and the soldier, seemingly with a death wish, tells Adonis that they should have ended his life 10 years ago along with that witch. Adonis, with some of the coldest eyes you will ever see, agrees that they should have ended him, and even he wishes they had. Before Adonis can take out more of his frustrations, Daroka arrives to stop him. She begs that he stop his rampage as he has already taken the lives of many citizens of this empire. She wonders if he hasn't done enough yet, and explains that she doesn't want to see any more innocent people die. The word innocent absolutely sets him off, and he shockingly ends the soldier's life right in front of her. Daroka has made a huge mistake as her trying to tell him that these people are innocent has made him realize something. He was confused but has now determined that whether they're radiant or not, all humans are his enemies, subjects for extermination, even if they're prisoners. Daroka shows no fear though and tells him that Chloe wouldn't want this. She foolishly pushes her luck by continuing to remind him about Chloe, but this just makes Adonis even more furious and he reminds the human scum to not casually speak Chloe's name. He assumes that Daroka is just there to distract him until the next wave of soldiers arrives. It's exactly the type of things humans would do since they always fight dirty, just like they did back then. He is certain that there's no way the witches would have lost to humans if they hadn't used cheap tricks. He tells Daroka to stay out of it since she knows nothing, however Daroka knows far more than he thought. She states that his name is Adonis. It was the name the world's greatest witch gave to her beloved student. She then shocks him to his core as she states that this is common knowledge for witches like herself. Adonis is in absolute disbelief for just a moment. She begins to introduce herself but Adonis becomes enraged again. He is certain that she's just messing with his head and he points out that all witches are dead. He tells the human scum to never speak of witches again, but she explains that they managed to survive the witch hunts. With a whirlwind of emotions, Adonis asks with frustration that if they survived, why didn't they come to save Chloe? Why did they let their fellow witch die? She apologizes over and over again and explains that they were all desperate to escape. Adonis doesn't want to hear any apologies though and reminds her that it's too late, Chloe's already gone. Daroka then leaves him in disbelief as she states that Chloe will come back. They will bring her back to life. Adonis only takes this as an insult though and prepares to end her life for her absurd lies. She pleads to him and explains that she infiltrated the country to save him in order to bring back Chloe. They need his memories of her, they need him to resurrect Chloe. Adonis doesn't even seem to be listening to her anymore as he summons a sword and continues asserting that he will end everyone. He will end her and anyone that gets in his way. He will end anyone who defies him and everyone who speaks of Chloe. Daroka decides that if that's what Adonis needs then she will gladly give her life to satisfy him. She says that she's just glad to have met him and Adonis is reminded of when Chloe said those exact words. Adonis collapses to the ground breaking down in tears. His relentless pursuit of revenge pauses for a moment overshadowed by the faintest glimmer of hope to bring back Chloe. Adonis isn't sure what to believe anymore, but is certain that he desperately wants Chloe back, and asks Daroka if it's really possible. She assures him that it is. Daroka instructs him to come with her and promises that he isn't alone anymore. Adonis, changing his focus from vengeance to a desperate grasp at hope, 
reaches out to her, only to be utterly stunned when Daroka gets shot. It's Ikao, and he's just disappointed he couldn't hit both of them. We then get a look into the recent past as the city is being invaded. Daroka is there and she can only watch hopelessly as her home is being destroyed. Her neighbors are being ended right before her eyes, but is surprised to see that Maya is still alive. Maya has no clue what happened and explains that the humans just attacked suddenly. Daroka can't make sense out of it as she points out that they were getting along so well with the humans until recently. Daroka wants to go full Hogwarts and magic everything back to normal, but Maya says that they can't and points out that the humans have brought a machine that suppresses their magic. Maya tells Daroka to run and tell someone named Ophelia what is happening as she might be able to help. Daroka wants Maya to come with her, but doesn't seem to realize that Maya has a giant hole in her back that looks like the Grand Canyon, and she probably won't be able to stand up, let alone go on a trip. Maya tells her how to get to Ophelia's house, and we finally get to see the origin story of the great night puppet she had in prison. Maya won't let the gaping hole in her back stop her from making one last performance, and she uses a puppet to tell Daroka that she is a strong girl. This absolute show woman hides the pain from her back cave, deepens her voice, and tells Daroka to run as quickly as she can. No one will be able to catch her and she will be there before she knows it. Daroka takes the puppet and begins running as Maya says her final goodbye. She knows not to look back as she runs as fast as she can and soldiers find Maya to finish off what they started. Back to the present, Adonis sits by Daroka's side after she has just been shot. He begs her not to die just yet and desperately asks her how he can bring Chloe back from the dead. She tells him something about the witches that we can't hear, but he has to move away quickly as bullets rain down on her. Surrounded by soldiers, Adonis' rage can never seem to end as he feels like he's being messed with. He was just given hope that Chloe could be brought back, but has no clue how to do it. The soldiers prepare to end Adonis' life, and the foolish Ikao, who stupidly shot the girl that was going to help Adonis, tells Yamamoto prematurely that Adonis is dead. However, we see that Adonis has picked up his quill and he tells the humans not to get cocky. The soldiers then just watch as Adonis prepares his attack, and only after a few seconds do they decide to shoot. These guys fire every bullet they have, but it's no use as they just bounce right off of Adonis' magic barrier. Yamato can hear the fight from a mile away and doesn't like what's happening. Once Adonis is done demonstrating his power, he turns the bullets against the soldiers and ends them. Adonis doesn't even break a sweat as he ends the entire group, only leaving one bald-headed dude. I guess Ikao didn't just watch what happened as he decides that it would be smart to shoot at Adonis. Other than making a big scene, the bullet does nothing, and Ikao is shocked to see that Adonis easily stopped it. Adonis uses his written style summoning magic on the already pretty big bullet, and makes it way bigger. Only now does Ikao realize that it was a bad idea, but it's too late as Adonis demands that he die, and he sends the giant bullet back. Shooting Daroka in front of Adonis was bad enough, but shooting at Adonis proved to be worse, as Ikat is now just a pair of legs. Adonis calls all the humans powerless insects and mocks them for thinking that they had any chance of beating him. Adonis speaks to the poor soul he left alive as he wonders if the humans really thought that he would let them live in peace after killing Chloe. Everyone watches from Earlobe headquarters as Adonis states that he will wipe every last one of the humans off the face of the planet. He vows to make them feel Chloe's despair. Yamato is completely powerless at this point and just hopes that Yuki can carry out her mission in time. We then watch as Yuki is in awe of the crown jewel of science that once defeated the witches. Once activated, they will be able to suppress Adonis' magic. We then learn that Yamato is actually her big brother. Luckily for her, those cartoonish earlobes don't seem to run in the family, but she does hope that activating the machine will make her useful to her brother. Yuki rushes her men to get things started, but they are stopped by one of the four national bureaus of the Redia Empire, the National Science Agency. Director Theta states that she knew the hot-blooded security bureau would show up and acknowledges how much Yuki has grown. Yuki is shocked to see Theta there and we see that what Yuki lacks in earlobe she makes up for with giant eyebrows. Theta won't allow them to activate the device and Yuki demands an explanation. Back at headquarters, Yamato lifts his phone all the way around his giant earlobe to receive a call from Yuki, but is shocked to hear that it's actually Theta. Yamato tells her that he has no time to speak as they are in a race against time, but he listens as what she has to say is of vital importance. She explains that the magic photon thingamajig cannot be activated. Science is the work of humanity that sheds light on the world. They have learned a lot, but there are still things that they don't understand. One of those things are the particles emitted by the device. She reminds him of the illness developed by soldiers who participated in the witch hunts 10 years ago called human cellular dysfunction disease. They can't say for certain, but they believe these particles affected the human body 
and this device kills cells. Yamato has never heard this before, but Theta explains that that's because they hid it. Unfortunately for the stupid humans, there are no more witches left to restore the natural environment. The atmosphere that would have cleansed these harmful rays is gone, and nature has fallen out of grace. As things are now, if a human body were exposed to a massive amount of particles, it would be destroyed. Yamato is more shocked than ever as he now realizes that it might have been the cause of Emperor Goeth's illness. A quick look back at the fight shows Adonis laughing maniacally as he easily stops more bullets from more soldiers and the same thing happens to them. They are quickly losing the battle and Yamato realizes this. Theta tells Yuki to return to the capital, but she takes off running for the device instead. She thinks about how they can't afford to worry about illnesses when the threat of magic is right before them and remembers how her big brother left this task in her hands. Theta tells everyone to evacuate and begs Yuki not to activate the device, as even a little exposure could have major consequences. Yuki isn't listening at all as she states that her mission is of national importance and the desperate girl activates the device. In the city, Adonis continues to laugh like a maniac but is shocked when his magic is stopped. Everyone at headquarters sees that Adonis has dropped his quill and Yamato desperately asks how Yuki is. Theta tells him that it was nothing but we see that she and Yuki are severely injured. While Theta turns off the device, Yamato desperately wants to know what happened, but Theta reminds him to focus on the task in front of him. She questions if Adonis is really someone that they can't beat without suppressing magic and asks him if they should really be having this much trouble against him. He recalls that his duty is to quickly exterminate those who harm the Empire and she declares with great pride that they are Redia, the indestructible empire. Yamato is inspired and commands all the units to charge. Adonis takes off in an attempt to get his quill, but it's too late as the soldiers are already prepared to fire. One very angry Karen gets in the line of fire, furious at Adonis for harming their nation. A building collapses between them and the other soldiers, but this one Karen couldn't care less and pulls out her thermal blade. Adonis wonders if he's finally going to die and is glad that he will be able to reunite with Chloe. The soldier doesn't hold back at all and takes his head off with one strike. The other soldiers can hardly see anything but the girl eventually emerges from the smoke with Adonis' head. She states that she ended the witch's apprentice. Everyone celebrates and she is hailed as a hero. Everyone at headquarters celebrates as well and Yamato sighs in relief. Yamato commends his troops but reminds them not to celebrate just yet. They still need to collect his body and confirm the damage done to each area of the city. Yamato is informed that the soldier that ended Adonis is a new recruit of the armored foot soldiers. His assistant wants to look into her further, but Yamato tells him to not bother as it's far more important to see how Director Theta and Vice Director Yuki are doing. The proud Yamato determines that Theta was right, their nation is strong. However, we see that Theta wasn't strong enough as her shredded up body is being taken away and so is Yuki. We then watch as Emperor Goeth gives another one of his classic and legendary speeches with tubes seemingly coming out of every part of his body to keep him from flatlining mid-sentence. He announces that magic somehow survived and the abominable witches still remained in this world. The boy they took from the witch's hands 10 years ago has been unleashed upon the world and it's the worst possible outcome. It's the long-term prisoner and witch's apprentice Adonis. Despite being human like them, Adonis is a remnant of the terrible old world enthralled by magic. Goeth showing what it would look like if life support needed life support explains that even after 10 years, they have failed to determine how Adonis was able to use magic as a human. Goeth reveals that he is enraged at himself for allowing Adonis to live, but he assures his people by reminding them that the Redia Empire is the pinnacle of the world. The power of science they've acquired and their iron-willed troops will yield to no evil. Goeth, who looks like a USB charging station at this point, wraps up his speech by telling his people to be proud they were born human in the Redia Empire. This psycho states that the old world is gone. God is dead and their nation is now God. At some random school, we see that some girl was watching the speech on HM Tube. The teacher acknowledges that things haven't been easy as a few of their students have died, and we see that some plant is on a desk in remembrance of one of them. The teacher's pet asks why the witch's apprentice sided with the witches if he was a human, but the teacher has no clue. Class is over and he probably just wants to get the heck out of there. The redheaded girl is approached by another girl who states that she saw what she did. The redhead instantly knows what she is talking about but defends herself by saying that it was a normal reaction to that situation. The girl decides to leave her alone but the redhead still hopes that she eats herself off the building. The redhead is named Aerie and she goes to the site of the destruction. She is furious at the Empire for not doing their job to protect the people and we see that she was the girl whose boyfriend was begging for help. 
She hesitated to help him and ultimately decided to run for her life, leaving him to wonder why she would abandon him just before being crushed. She feels terrible for abandoning him, but even worse for being physically attracted to the guy using magic. A guy surprises her and she can instantly tell that he is with the government. She tries to delete the photo she has of Adonis, but the man tells her that it's okay and he will keep her secret. He points out that the witch's apprentice is the heinous criminal who caused the disaster, but he wouldn't snitch on her. Eri apologizes and takes her leave. We quickly find out that this guy's name is Oz Gorgeous and he is a two-faced jerk. He makes a call to give the girl's exact location. He explains that she seems to have been influenced by the terrorist and orders that she be seized. He wants the National Security Bureau to decide what will happen to her, but he is certain that she will either be executed or imprisoned for treason. He exclaims that inspecting the disaster area is pretty exhausting, but is told that the final check is complete. Oz decides to return to base and tells the girl over the phone named Charmy to give him a hug and a kiss when he gets back. Charmy is obviously annoyed and requests that Chief Oz address her transfer request so she can get the heck out of there. She has had enough of working overtime every day and the boss who abuses their power and harasses her. Moving on from that though, she reveals that some unbelievable analysis just came in and asks Oz to return right away. As we see that Adonis is there, she shockingly reveals that the body they captured is a fake and we see that Adonis wakes up somewhere else. We then hear Adonis screaming in agony and see that he is being held down by several women. They are concerned because his body temperature, heart rate, and blood pressure are rising rapidly. His heart won't be able to take much more and little miss I told you so says that she knew a human wouldn't be able to withstand heterophase transfer. Madame Ophelia arrives to calm everyone down and prepares to return Adonis to his senses by stimulating his brain. She dives right in and Adonis begins to have memories of his past but his pain persists. Of course, he calls out to his beloved Chloe and begins to recall that he didn't actually die. He sees his own fake body parts scattered around and that one soldier Karen says the words duplication magic, death cancel. Adonis has no clue what that means and the Karen actually turns out to be Anna, the girl that infiltrated the nation with Daroka. Everything has been done with the intention of bringing Chloe back to life, so Anna is there to get Adonis out of there. Adonis wants to know more about Anna, but there's no time to explain, and she has Ophelia take him away. The magic is painful, but it takes Adonis to safety, and Anna apologizes to her deceased friend Daroka. Adonis wakes up in this strange place, and the old Ophelia thanks him for fighting for them. Our boy is understandably pretty jaded and doesn't trust anyone, but Ophelia reveals that he is now in the Nation of Witches, where his hair mark can finally begin. Our boy gets rolled around because his legs don't work, and takes a look at all the harem potential. Some witches clearly don't know that they shouldn't be triggering this guy as they mention how Chloe would be happy to see him recovering so quickly. Luckily for them, Adonis doesn't lose his mind when hearing Chloe's name as he's actually glad to hear that they knew Chloe when they were younger and Adonis genuinely smiles for the first time in a very long while. Adonis hilariously tells the person who has been pushing him this entire time that he can actually walk just fine, but Ophelia explains that human influence can't touch this secluded land. She also says that the path he has taken to get there is far beyond what he can imagine and his body has been through too much stress. Ophelia strangely takes a big ol' whiff of a lemon and Adonis just wants to know what she did to him. She explains that she simply invited him and reveals that she knew Chloe just like every witch in the nation. Ophelia says that Chloe was stronger, smarter, more cheerful, and kinder than anyone else. However, she was cast out of the witch's nation. Adonis' anger begins to creep up again as he points out that Ophelia was the one that cast her out for teaching magic to a human child. Ophelia is surprised that Chloe told him about that, but Adonis reveals that he just figured it out. Ophelia then explains how important magic is to witches as it represents the friendship and devotion God granted to them in order to lead humankind. This lady is really playing with fire here as she says that magic is not something a human should ever be taught. Chloe took on a human apprentice and they didn't understand her intentions. Adonis is starting to get that angry look in his face again and she explains that at the time, every witch begged Chloe to abandon her apprentice and return. Ophelia then has a heartfelt memory of how Chloe would always just say no politely. Adonis doesn't seem to care one bit and asks the old lady if she is done reminiscing. She is but this lady is not to be messed with as she shows our boy his quill. Adonis desperately tries to get it and hilariously tells a girl to get out of the way even though she wasn't in his way at all. Instant karma strikes as his body gives out on him and Ophelia analyzes the amazing magical quill. It has a magic imbued phoenix feather with adornments resembling waves and a red dragon's eye. 
She gives it back to Adonis and it becomes clear that Chloe made it for him as he holds it close. Adonis is ready to get down to business and asks Ophelia if they can really bring Chloe back from the dead. Ophelia explains that witches don't lie and Adonis' hope is restored. A look to the sky shockingly reveals that our boy might be an astronaut now as he isn't even on Earth anymore. Ophelia explains that the witch's secluded land is beyond the reach of humans. They arrived there 10 years ago and it became a place for witches to live peacefully once more. This is the new witch's nation called Luna Milia. Adonis then puts on a spacesuit to get a better view and we find that witches apparently don't need oxygen. She explains that science revealed humankind's true nature and she wonders if God made the earth round so the stupid humans wouldn't see too far into the future. Adonis refuses to abide by that and Ophelia shows him their witch cemetery. She gives a little speech about how humans focus too much on sayings and how the king really believed the saying witches will corrupt humankind. Things then get really crazy when she takes him to a tree called a mito that apparently produces the witches. This is Adonis' first time seeing one and he explains that Chloe hated talking about her origins, probably because she was born from a tree like some kind of apple. The situation gets even worse as any hopes of Adonis developing the largest witch harem ever known to man are instantly crushed when Ophelia explains that witches are unisex. Unlike humans, they do not have mating pairs. They are given life by the trees as fruits containing the power of God. This tree right here is the last surviving tree brought there from the planet's surface. Humans burned all the other Mito, so this is the only tree left that can give birth and regenerate witches. The word regenerate starts giving our boy ideas and he thinks that Chloe might be in one of the tree balls. Ophelia explains that right now it's just merely a witch waiting to be born and she needs his strength to become Chloe. This needs a lot of explanation and this lady does not disappoint. She begins by saying that magic is the act of giving an individual's thoughts a physical form in the material world. Adonis' written style summoning magic, depending on his proficiency, can be used to give form to any and all thoughts. She uses memory as an example and says that memory is life itself. If Adonis could seal his memories of Chloe within that fruit, then perhaps they can get what they are looking for. In the end, Adonis is the key to Chloe's resurrection, so she tells him to let her know when he is ready. Adonis takes a moment to let everything sink in and he can't believe that it is his magic that will resurrect Chloe. Just then, Anna appears from nowhere but is furious and asks him if there's anything he has to say. Adonis thinks she's waiting for a thank you but this just gets her more upset and she reminds him with tears in her eyes that Daroka died for him. Adonis seems to have lost all emotion and simply tells her that it's not his problem. He reminds her that they were the ones that planned everything so they shouldn't take their anger out on him. Anna is furious when Adonis walks away from her and she points out how selfish humans are. She begins to wonder why they risk their lives for someone like him, but this absolutely triggers Adonis. He has an answer for her and explains that he knows the real reason they saved him. Anna is shocked but Adonis tells her to stop playing dumb and we quickly learn that this anime has more twists than a pretzel factory when we see what Daroka told Adonis before she died. She shockingly revealed that the witches are planning to use Chloe and told him that he and Chloe need to flee from the witches nation. The shocking revelations don't stop there as Adonis points out that the witches can live in extreme environments without protective gear, so they did not need to build such a huge facility. What this facility really is is a cage for them to keep humans in. Sherlock Holmes over here has deduced that the witches plan to kidnap human slaves and kids using their heterophase transfer. Then they will teach them written style summoning magic and make them fight for them. Witches are on the verge of extinction, so they need an alternative source of soldiers to win. Our detective knows that only Chloe can make quills, and that is the real reason they want to resurrect her. Adonis walks away like a boss, but Anna chases after him. She wonders what he will do with this information and desperately asks him to help them. Adonis reveals that he will still resurrect Chloe, that part hasn't changed. He is a simple simp and he has always just followed Chloe's will. So if Chloe rejects them, then the witches will be his enemy too. The ceremony begins very soon after and Adonis uses his written style summoning magic called Nostalgic Memories. His memories fled into the tree ball and we get to see some of them. Times were far simpler back then. Adonis was a bratty little kid and Chloe was his loving caretaker. She once was amazed by how Adonis seemingly memorized all the constellations and wondered if he was some sort of divine prodigy. She realized that she was the one that taught him and jokingly wondered if that makes her a god. The two have a good laugh and Adonis thinks about how he wouldn't trade the time he spent with her for anything. 
More memories rush in and Adonis remembers a time where he saw that Chloe was covered in scars. She teased him about being a pervert and he told her that he would go stand guard. In that moment, the normally very strong Chloe broke down and thanked Adonis for staying with her as she wouldn't be able to live in this world alone. He says now that he can't live in this world alone either and tells Chloe that he loves her. Adonis envisions Chloe in front of him saying thank you as the ceremony is complete, but shockingly the witch that is revived is not Chloe, it's Daroka. Adonis knew that the witches were lying and they really just wanted to revive Chloe for selfish reasons. Adonis wants to see Chloe again more than anything in the world, but he didn't want her to live a life where she would either be used by the witches or hunted by the humans. That is when Adonis decided that he wasn't going to bring his precious Chloe back to life because he never wanted to make her feel the pain she felt again. He realized that there's no place for an angel like her in this horrible world. Ophelia was shocked when she realized that Adonis rewrote the ritual and everyone watching was left speechless when Daroka was the one to emerge from the tree. Adonis' reason for picking Daroka is simple, he didn't want to leave his debt unpaid. The now alive again Daroka is of course stunned when she realizes that she is back at Luna Milia after being shot, but is more upset about not having clothes on. She apologizes for Adonis having to see something so filthy and unsightly and begs him to erase it from his memories. Luckily for her, Adonis has something for her to wear and simply tells her that they are even now. Ophelia is of course very upset that he didn't bring back Chloe since they have been doing their best to supposedly help him. They risked their lives to rescue him and even healed his wounds. They guaranteed his safety so that he could bring back Chloe from the dead. The crowd of witches really start to turn on him after he ruined all their efforts. They determine that he is merely a human after all and he must not have really loved Chloe. They all assume that he has chosen Daroka over Chloe and accuse Daroka of seducing our boy and putting ideas in his head. These witches are really starting to get on Adonis' nerves as he silences them all and explains that his decision to not resurrect Chloe was all his own. Ophelia, the confident old lady, has a good laugh as she is not impressed with him at all. She prepares to attack Adonis as she reminds him that he is merely a human, but is then shocked when some strange particles appear. Adonis explains that he was imprisoned for a very long time by the humans and shockingly pulls a tracking device that was implanted in his body. He proclaims that he will be the one to annihilate humanity and he doesn't want these treacherous witches getting in his way. He destroys the chip and shockingly the Mito tree is consumed by flames. The one who did it is Yamato who could never have guessed on his own that there was still a witch tree left. Yamato keeps his giant earlobes hidden and really shows his hate for the witches when he describes them as the last of an evil race. He compares them, along with the witch's apprentice Adonis, to rats in a cage. Adonis acts offended since he was the one that invited them all there and chillingly calls the place a graveyard in anticipation of the massacre that's to come. One brave witch calls out to her precious leader Ophelia and tells her not to worry as she will save the Mito tree. She conjures up a water spell to extinguish the fire but pays the ultimate price. Ophelia knows that they are in grave danger and calls upon a witch named Santa Maria to suit everyone up Power Ranger style. Ophelia remains confident and tells everyone to prepare for battle. Adonis prepares to use written style summoning magic, but Yamato knows the danger in that and instantly attacks him. Adonis uses his magic to fire Yamato's own gun at him and our boy starts to unload the entire clip on this guy. Yamato's suit is holding up well, but several warnings go off inside the suit as the damage levels are rising rapidly. Adonis's hate for the humans continues, so he tells Yamato to get back up since he intended to end his life. Just then, Daroka manages to get his attention and he can only wonder what she wants. The other witches get to work on the soldiers, showing an amazing display of magic. The Venom Fang Witch uses an insane snake attack to send a bunch of dudes to God, and another witch covers them in crystals. The Swarm Witch uses centipedes to make holes in some other guys with a spell she calls the Human Hotel. The witches clearly have the upper hand and Ophelia hasn't even shown what she is capable of. Some soldiers try to prepare against her, but they are not nearly ready for what she has in store. Ophelia lifts these dudes off the ground and all they can say is Nani, as she easily diverts their bullets. She clumps several of them together like a human meatball and uses a spell she calls Death Game to crush them. Ophelia is feeling pretty confident at this point, obnoxiously pointing out how humans are so feeble and compares them to infants. She is confident that victory will be theirs, but this lady apparently hasn't looked around in a minute because another squad of humans have arrived and they already took out female Harry Potter. Ophelia's confidence is unwavering though as it only seems like the humans are planning to outnumber them. Elsewhere, the humans watch what is happening and wonder how so many witches could still be left. We see that Theta's there but she only has months left to live due to radiation from the magic stopping machine doohickey. 
the bureau director demands an explanation from her, and she starts by showing them a transport device the humans created back in the day. From the images she shows them, it's evident that the witches captured the device and used the humans' own science to flee beyond the skies. Professor X is furious to hear that the witches then used magic camouflage to hide their entire moon base, and points out that the National Science Agency receives a massive annual budget, so things like this should never have been allowed to happen. The people think the witch extermination wars ended 10 years ago, so this failure of hers will cost more than just her life. Director Shiro is the calmest person in the room though, as he tells Professor X to shut up. He points out that the witch hunt really is over, and all they have to do is clean up the loose ends on the moon. We then see that Yamato is having a flashback to when he watched over his sister Yuki, who was in pretty bad shape. Yuki has always been by his side, and eventually became the youngest vice director in history. She is truly amazing, but unfortunately, not amazing enough to keep radiation from frying her internal organs. Everyone is pretty much blaming the very soon-to-be-dead Theta for everything going wrong, including Yamato, who breaks down when he points out that Yuki is just 14 years old. Yamato turns his anger to Adonis now and vows to make him pay as he sets the suit's arm output to 500%. Yamato is ready to continue fighting, so Adonis realizes how tough this guy is. He tries to shoot him, but Yamato's speed is crazy, and his punch is incredibly powerful. Yamato can't understand why Adonis would side with the witches. Daroka rushes to Adonis' side, but he reminds the fool to always keep an eye on the opponent. He is right because Yamato's preparing for a crazy attack, and we see that he is fueled by thoughts of enjoying a peaceful life with his sister after everything is over. Yamato's power is surging rapidly, and he unleashes an anti-witch attack called Scattering Blossoms. This insane attack slices a bunch of witches in half, but Adonis just barely manages to dodge it. Ophelia can't believe all her witches are being ended, but knows that she is inflexible like our boy Adonis, and she gets diced up too. Daroka isn't spared by the attack as her body falls apart, but luckily her bestie casts duplication magic just in time to save her. Anna thanks Daroka for being her friend, but we see that she apparently can't use duplication magic on herself as her head falls apart. Meanwhile, Headquarters tries to contact the attack force since their video signal was lost. We then see the aftermath of the absolute literal bloodbath as Daroka is in tears. Daroka just wants it all to stop, but it isn't over yet as Adonis and Yamato are still standing. Yamato reports back that the witches have been neutralized and all that's left is to exterminate the witch's apprentice. Our boy has plenty of fight left in him and uses his magic to summon a suit of his own. The fight begins as Adonis uses his magic to alter his armor however he pleases. He creates a punch so powerful it snaps Yamato's arm, breaks his sword, and goes straight through his chest. Fortunately for Yamato, his suit, made from amazing human science, is able to repair his body and his sword. Adonis isn't impressed by the silly tricks, but Yamato says it's better than dumb magic. The last remaining witches have given up all hope, but Ophelia's upper body just won't shut up, and tells them that it's not over. The other witches, who actually still have all their body parts, are more realistic. They point out that their mito tree is burned to a crisp, so all witches will now go extinct. However, one green-haired witch is ready to take over the leadership role and inspires the group with a brave speech. She has come up with a brilliant plan where they back up Adonis and defeat the humans. Unfortunately, her plan has a hole in it because more soldiers arrive and put a hole in her with a bullet. The humans' plan to outnumber them has worked as these soldiers finish off the remaining witches. Adonis' fight continues, but Yamato prepares to end it when he sets his suit to its maximum electrothermal output. Yamato moves with lightning speed to pierce our boy right through his chest. Yamato starts talking real big, but is shocked when he notices that Adonis managed to use his magic to summon a giant sword. Our boy is done messing around as the sword slams down on Yamato, and he is left one-sided. Yamato's stupid suit thinks it's necessary to tell him that major damage has been done, but I'm sure Yamato notices that his arm is missing. Yamato has the suit stop the bleeding, and Adonis can't help but notice that they both have the very similar look of revenge in their eyes. The last few remaining witches beg for their lives, but the soldiers prepare to end them anyway. Yamato explains to Adonis that he's too dangerous, so he can't allow him to live. Adonis doesn't have a single bit of fear in his eyes, and gives a chilling smile as he simply says no, just as Yamato goes in for the final blow. Back at headquarters, everyone frantically tries to regain the signal on the moon. They have no clue what's going on up there, but are shocked to finally receive a signal. It's Yamato, and he shocks everyone when he reveals that they have won. All the witches on the moon's surface have been eliminated. All the humans begin to celebrate, but we see that something isn't quite right, as Yamato's eyes are now red. We go back moments later to just before Yamato is about to strike down Adonis. Adonis has no fear, but Daroka shouts for everything to stop. Yamato is in disbelief as he can't move his own body, and Adonis is impressed as it's clear that Daroka has a wide range of spells. 
she has just cast the love spell and it affects all the soldiers as well. She introduces herself and Yamato gives his name, but it was completely against his own will. His mouth opened on its own so he realizes that the spell he is under is incredibly dangerous. The other witches watch and begin to think that Daroka might be able to turn things around with her special magic. Yamato demands that she remove her spell but she refuses. Our revenge seeking protagonist is thirsty for blood and tells Daroka to end Yamato's life by tearing out his throat. Yamato's rage turns to shock when Daroka simply extends him her hand and pleads for all the fighting to stop. She wants him to shake her hand and promise that he won't attack Adonis or the other witches. If he just makes this promise then she will free everyone from the spell. Our jaded protagonist becomes furious though as he reminds her that they killed Anna. His revenge filled brain can't comprehend what she is doing and he calls her crazy for even thinking of letting the humans leave alive. The other witches agree as he points out all the lives they have taken and he warns her that the humans will likely take her life if she doesn't end them first. Yamato proves to be a psycho as well as he says that Adonis is right and somehow manages to attack Daroka. He tells her to know her place and explains that the humans will use their science to exterminate them all. He rains punches down on her while telling her how naive she was to think that they could have peace between them. To the humans, witches are a scourge that bring terror and chaos and their mere existence is destroying the world. Yamato is releasing all his anger as he points out how much harm the witch's apprentice has done to humanity. He has taken countless innocent lives and he wouldn't have existed if not for the horrible witches. Yamato wants the witches to finally just accept their extermination and we see that the soldiers are able to move again. Yamato thinks about how Yuki wouldn't be in the condition she is in if it wasn't for the witches and he beats Daroka relentlessly. Daroka somehow manages to speak and tells him that the humans have taken countless lives as well. Not even just the massacre they just did right now but the extermination of witches 10 years ago. Daroka understands that the humans feel like they don't need the witches anymore because they have their precious science but she can't understand why they feel the need to exterminate the witches. She points out that humans and witches used to be friends and once again pleads that they put an end to the fighting. Daroka would like for him to start by ordering the retreat of his men but Yamato is still filled with rage. She casts her love spell on him again and Yamato begins to feel strange. He shows his intense resolve though as he reminds himself who he is and proclaims that he won't be beaten by some magic spell. He tries really hard to break the spell but he then imagines himself as a child hugging Daroka and this dude gets simplified by her spell. With loving eyes, Yamato tells Daroka that he will obey her but he just ends up with a blade through his skull. Of course it was our rage filled protagonist and he explains that revenge is all he has. Daroka can't believe what she just saw and is furious with Adonis. He is completely single minded though as he realizes how strong Daroka's love spell is and he tells her that they will use her magic to destroy humanity. At the royal palace, the king is told that their strike force is still fighting and they are not sure if the witches will be defeated as they are putting up quite a fight. Unfortunately, their communication with headquarters is poor so they aren't sure of all the details. The king once again asks if they will defeat the witches so the terrified soldier just tells him that he believes their victory is certain. The queen wonders if the witch's apprentice is there as well and they are both glad to hear that he is. The king graces us with his impeccable mustache and demands that his soldiers burn the witches along with the entire moon if they have to. This genocidal maniac rejoices as he sees that the end is nearing for all the witches and the brat who wanted revenge against humanity. This guy that was just giving really convincing speeches just a few episodes ago is really losing his mind now as he laughs like a maniac. He calls the witches sore losers for running off to the moon but states that they can never escape. The king wants to be assured by his wife so he asks her to tell him how incredible he is and asks for her to praise him. He is really having his moment now as he has finally achieved his goal of exterminating the witches and everyone celebrates. The poor soldier that has had to listen to his psychotic rant thinks about how he had heard that the king's condition was deteriorating but he had no idea it was this bad. He is then shocked as the queen holds the king and tells him that everything is going to be okay. The king just acts like a baby sometimes and needs to be praised. She praises him for enduring so much stress for such a long time and the king just keeps repeating over and over again how much he loves her. We then see why the king is like this as the queen shockingly uses the love spell on him. She compliments him for finally eliminating the witches and tells him that he can end his own life now. She has some little boy scouts play a little tune and she praises the king for walking as if he were a toddler. The king has a jolly old time as he makes his way to the ledge but the soldier is shocked and wonders what is wrong with the king. King Goeth is completely gone at this point and explains that he has always given the queen what she wanted. He is truly the king of simps so he will gladly give his own life to make her happy. 
The king is proud of himself for climbing up to the best spot, but the soldier begs for him to come down. Emperor Goeth refuses to be stopped and lists off all his accomplishments as a great leader. He made several scientific advancements and made the Redia Empire the strongest nation in the world. He eradicated the witches and he did all these things for his beloved queen. Goeth is completely under the simplification spell as he states that he wishes he could serve his queen forever. Of course the queen loves to hear this, but she clearly doesn't care a single bit about him and simply tells him to hurry up and jump. Emperor Goeth graces us with his immaculate mustache one last time and eagerly jumps off the building. The queen removes the spell and we see that there is no coming back for the king. The soldier who witnessed it all calls for backup since there is clearly a witch in the castle, but the queen says that the king just slipped and fell. She uses her simplification magic on this poor guy, so he corrects himself and reports that the king accidentally fell to his death. Shiro, the guy from that meeting with Professor X, has apparently been there the entire time, and the queen tells him to speak as he clearly has something on his mind. She wonders if she shouldn't have ended the king's life, but Shiro couldn't care less, and points out that that puppet was no longer necessary. The queen points out that her spell only works on men. Her kind is too much of a threat against her, so that is why they needed to be eliminated. Shiro points out that the world can be hers now, but she calls him an idiot as she doesn't want this world. He should already know what she really wants, and she threatens to take his life just like this poor soldier's if he doesn't bring her Adonis's real head this time. Shiro promises the queen that he won't fail her, but she proclaims that she is no longer a queen. She then reveals her true identity as the Witch of the Unknown, named Dorothea. Her goal is to get someone back, and we see that this person looks like a red-headed version of Adonis. Back on the moon, Daroka rejects Adonis' plan to use her magic to destroy humankind. Adonis is clearly demented as he still smiles and tells Daroka not to release her spell. He goes after the soldiers who still can't move and tells them to cry the same way he did when they took Chloe's life. Daroka begs him to stop but it's far too late as our protagonist slices through all their troops. Daroka can only watch in horror but she knows what she must do. She never wanted to have to use her spell on him but Adonis clearly won't stop otherwise. Adonis instantly appears before her and threatens to make her unalive again if she tries to cast her spell on him. Adonis continues his massacre as the soldiers beg for their lives and Daroka tries to tell him that this won't change anything. Revenge will only give birth to more revenge. Adonis isn't in the mood to be lectured, but Daroka explains that she's just tired of all the fighting. All the death is too sad for her to take, but Adonis is practically the opposite as he can't stop. He finishes up all the soldiers and finds a motto to steal his face. Adonis vows to make the humans pay with their extinction and uses a spell to change his voice to Yamato's. We then go back to the present when Adonis, pretending to be Yamato, reports back to headquarters. He explains that the battle was fierce and none of the witches survived. Unfortunately, aside from himself, none of the humans did either. Yamato explains that he will be returning alone and he tells them to bring him back, but we see that Theta can tell that this thing they are looking at is not Yamato. Some witches that are watching are horrified and we see that Adonis is using Amato's face as a mask. He once again commands that they teleport him back and he promises to bring back the head of the witch's apprentice. Ophelia's upper body is still somehow alive and she realizes that this is what Adonis planned all along. Adonis tries to take Daroka with him since her spell will be very useful, but she refuses. Daroka must have a death wish as she slaps Adonis and points out how ashamed Chloe would be if she saw what he was doing. Luckily for her, Adonis doesn't go all crazy on her as the transportation has been initiated. Ophelia's heart is still just pumping away, so she bids farewell to Adonis, the infinitely evil child of the wicked humans. She hopes that God will judge him for his crimes and she apologizes to her fellow witches for failing to reclaim their dignity. Ophelia finally bids farewell to this world and to the kingdoms of ruin. Adonis and Daroka are being teleported and Adonis does something entirely unexpected. He says he is sorry for some reason. Back at headquarters, they prepare for Yamato's return. However, Theta already knows that it's Adonis that will be coming back, and they are ready. She vows to avenge Yamato's death as the teleportation countdown reaches zero, and she commands all the soldiers to open fire. The gunfire stops soon after as nothing was teleported, and it is announced that transfer coordinates were somehow changed. His signal is lost and Theta collapses as her body is falling apart. She realizes that he escaped and tells the witch's apprentice that he has won this round. Somewhere out in the desert, we find Daroka and Adonis. Adonis tells her to look at a constellation that confirms they are back on the planet's surface. Our boy is covered in blood but has a huge goal. He declares that the two of them will begin their conquest of the Redia Empire by doing whatever they have to, and they will start small. 
we then get a glimpse of what happened just before the teleportation. Daroka was begging Adonis to help the witches that were still alive on the moon, but Adonis was too busy using his voice changing magic to change the teleportation coordinates automatically. Our ventral protagonist decides that they will attack cities and villages on their way to Redia. They will also gather information and supplies to prepare themselves. Adonis is thinking way ahead and is ready to move, but Daroka isn't having any of it. She wants to go back to the other witches, but Adonis calls her stupid for thinking that any of the witches on the moon survived. She refuses to believe that they all died and tells him to send her back. He calls her a spoiled child, but Daroka gets really snappy with him and wonders if he is talking about himself. She thinks that he is clearly more childish since all he cares about is revenge. Adonis then uses his memory magic. He shows Daroka how she pleaded for Yamato to take her hand while promising that he wouldn't hurt them anymore. She can't bear to watch her failure and Adonis now realizes why Daroka didn't fit in with the other witches. The other witches hated the humans and only a psychopath like her would want to reconcile with them. Daroka reveals that she always wanted to meet with Adonis one day because she wanted to know what kind of person Chloe chose as her apprentice. Adonis was a man living between two worlds so she had hoped that he could become a bridge between humans and witches. He was her only hope but she couldn't be more wrong. It's clear to Adonis now that she knows nothing about him and she wonders how far he will go. Humankind will never forgive him the same way he will never forgive them, so the fighting will never stop. Adonis silences her and states that Chloe's life is more precious than all of humanity. The world that took her from him made a huge mistake and deserves to be destroyed. This pink haired girl just can't understand his rage and wonders how much he is willing to sacrifice. She blames him for what happened to all the witches on the moon because he summoned the humans there, but he points out that summoning humans was the only way to get them back to earth. All her friends were just pawns in his plan and Daroka somehow still can't believe how cold hearted he is. She becomes really upset since those witches battled so hard to survive the witch hunts only to become pawns in his selfish plan, but Adonis silences her again. He can't understand how she can continue to argue for the humans when they took so many of her friends lives. Adonis accuses her of committing the greatest crime against their lives by not wanting revenge. Daroka still disagrees and states that revenge won't heal any wounds. Adonis however doesn't care anymore. He begins to walk away as he states that he has nothing left to lose. Daroka just won't let it go as she tackles him and reminds Adonis that he still has the life that Chloe works so hard to protect. In a world filled with cruelty, Daroka begs that he not let it change him. She isn't even asking him to forgive the humans. Daroka just knows that if he continues seeking revenge, then it will shatter his heart and he will become more like the people that took Chloe from him. Daroka thinks that he still has plenty to lose, but the two just can't understand each other. Revenge is proof of Adonis' existence and irreplaceable proof that Chloe lived with him. Adonis feels like every last trace of Chloe's existence would simply vanish if he stopped seeking revenge, and that thought terrifies him. Daroka breaks down in tears and Adonis points out that all she does is cry. They seem to finally be understanding each other a little bit, but Daroka realizes that Adonis' health is declining rapidly. A bunch of bikers spot them in the distance and wonder if they are a couple that just eloped. Their ringleader is called Mr. Punch and he's left to decide what will be done with them. Sometime later, Adonis wakes up in a strange place. Our boy is getting pretty tired of waking up in places he doesn't recognize and tries to remember what happened. He remembers Daroka asking the bikers for help as he was quickly losing blood and couldn't move. Mr. Punch arrives to welcome him and wonders if the cold look on Adonis' eyes means that he has taken someone's life. This guy doesn't have the slightest clue and simply offers Adonis a drink. Adonis has no interest in drinking sewer water, but Punch explains that it's actually man's greatest invention. Adonis just wants to know where Daroka is and Punch explains that she was watching over Adonis until a second ago when some of the youngsters took her away. Adonis isn't playing any game so he asks him again where she is, so Punch takes him outside. Punch welcomes him to the wastelands a place filled with people from developing countries, refugees, and slaves who escaped from Redia. Everyone left behind by science simply ends up there and becomes a vagrant. Just then, Adonis hears Daroka's voice begging for someone to stop. She is surrounded by men so Adonis wonders what they are doing to her. Punch explains that they don't get many women in the wastelands and grossly says that Adonis' girlfriend is really good at screaming. Adonis has had enough of these people and instantly rushes to save Daroka. He prepares to annihilate all the scum, but is shocked when he sees that Daroka is just learning to ride a motorcycle. She was begging for someone to stop the motorcycle, but all the guys are just encouraging her to learn. Daroka is glad to see that Adonis is awake, but she face plants straight into the ground. She is concerned about his injuries, but she looks to be in pretty bad shape herself. 
Daroka gives Adonis some little figurines and apologizes for not realizing how injured he was. Our boy is just as cold as ever though and tosses the little things. Punch declares that they will be throwing a party and has Arduo help prepare as payment for rescuing them. That night, everyone gets hammered and Daroka serves the drinks. Some old dude tries to get smooth with her, but she leaves him in the dust. Adonis isn't in the partying mood, which makes Daroka a bit sad, so some guys wonder if she's in the middle of a fight with her boyfriend. She tries to clear things up about them not being together, but no one believes her. They want to know what their story is, so Daroka just says that her and her friend are traveling the world. They all have a good laugh as they can't believe they would come visit the wastelands, but they all think that she's a really nice girl. Just then, the guys shockingly begin collapsing. Daroka has no clue what is happening, but Adonis calls them all idiots for not being more careful with what they put in their mouths. Daroka fears the worst as she questions if Adonis poisoned them, but he hasn't. He simply used his magic to change their alcohol's formula into a tranquilizer. Daroka is just glad that everyone is still alive, but Adonis says that won't be for long as he finds a gun. Daroka begs him to stop and points out that they have all been so kind to them. They rescued them from the desert and even gave them medical aid. Adonis couldn't care less, but Daroka points out that if it wasn't for them, his life would have ended in the desert. Adonis explains that he isn't going to end their lives, but only because vagrants like them are not worth killing. Adonis then shocks her when he reveals that he no longer needs her. She wants an explanation, so he says that unlike her, he can't laugh after losing someone important to him. He can't even imagine relaxing and joking around. Adonis has determined that they are fundamentally incompatible. Daroka explains her behavior by pointing out that bad things will happen if humans find out who they really are. They have to blend in with them because she can't let them suspect that she is a witch. Daroka laughs to keep up appearances, but there's no way she could really just be fine after what happened. Adonis just silences her once again to tell her never to end up like him and he leaves. The next morning, Mr. Punch wonders if Daroka's boyfriend left. She corrects him about Adonis not being her boyfriend and Punch can't help but point out how brazen Adonis is. He left without so much as a thank you and left Daroka there all on her own. Punch thinks that she made the right decision by breaking up with him. Daroka can see something in Adonis that no one else can though and she knows that he is actually really kind. We then see Adonis all alone as he thinks about everything Daroka told him. She has made a serious impression on our cold-hearted protagonist with all her advice, but he actually hates it. Just then, he sees that someone has come after him and he wonders if he made the tranquilizer too weak. He then suspects that it might be someone from the Red Empire. It doesn't really matter who it is though, so he prepares for a fight and declares that he will end the life of anyone that gets in his way. Back in the wastelands, Daroka is absolutely stunned when Mr. Punch reveals that he knew that Adonis was the witch's apprentice all along. Daroka tries to deny it, but it's no use. Mr. Punch says that Adonis is a completely different man now and has a memory from his past. He was dying in the desert when Chloe the Ice Witch and her young apprentice saved him. Mr. Punch explains that the greatest happiness a man can know is having something worth fighting against the entire world for. This guy is the wisest biker you will ever see and he explains that you will never settle an argument over whether or not revenge is wrong. Adonis has chosen revenge and even if it leads to his death, that is his choice. He wonders what Daroka plans to do and she explains that she doesn't want anyone else to die because she failed to protect Anna and the others. Daroka refuses to let Adonis die, so Mr. Punch wonders what she is still doing there talking to him. We then see that the one coming after Adonis was actually Daroka, and he wonders if she is trying to end his life. Daroka promises to not get in his way and asks to let her travel with him. Adonis is shocked as Daroka explains that she gave it some thought and thinks that Adonis does need her. It's dangerous to travel alone and good company makes traveling seem quicker. She thinks they would both benefit, but Adonis just wonders why she didn't stop. He can't believe what a noisy girl she is and goes after her. This anime finally has a lighthearted moment as Adonis chases after the out of control Daroka. Mr. Punch just hopes that Adonis won't make Daroka cry and wishes luck to Chloe's beloved apprentice. Elsewhere, we see that tons of people have gathered for the new Imperial coronation. Oz watches over the city and is glad to see how peaceful it is. At a stadium, the 23rd Emperor of the Redia Empire is praised for all his success. Besides having an impeccable mustache, he also was responsible for human civilization's rapid progress. These guys have futuristic trains and cell phones thanks to him, so they no longer need the power of the witches. Their scientific and military might seize dignity for humankind. Emperor Goeth was super smart, but unfortunately not smart enough to avoid death. The nation has been restless without their fearless leader, but that ends now as they prepare to welcome the nation's new monarch. 
A countdown begins and everyone eagerly anticipates seeing their new leader. The countdown ends and everyone cheers for their majesty, Queen Dorothea. The entire scene is pretty strange as everyone screams out to her and she does her best impression of a K-pop star. Her performance is broadcasted everywhere and we see that Dorothea is using her simp spell on all the K-pop stands that are watching. Dorothea becomes super popular across all forums on the internet and guys everywhere get in trouble with their girlfriends. Mid-performance, Dorothea tells all her new adoring fans that she loves them all. Elsa, we see that the broadcast has reached even the furthest regions. Some dude watches on his dragon phone and he points out the irony in how Dorothea is a witch and now the monarch of humanity. She exterminated her own kind using the science humans developed while ruling the world as its queen. Meanwhile, we see that people are getting their heads chopped off and Theta doesn't seem to be pleased with what is happening. The dragon phone guy wonders what the world is coming to and just now realizes that the witch known as Dorothea is even crazier than predicted. We then see why Theta was so upset as her head is added to a pile. Nearby, Dorothea finishes up her K-pop performance and particles emerge from the crowd. These particles converge on her head to form her crown and the stadium erupts with applause for their new leader. Meanwhile, in the wastelands, Shiro is super happy for Dorothea. However, his nose begins to bleed as he is upset since this is kind of like when a childhood friend becomes super popular at school. Shiro has a job to do but he points out how smart Adonis is. He broke the device he took from Yamato so Shiro can't use it to trace him. Shiro decides that he will have to find our boy the hard way and spawns a whole bunch of useful robot hands. We see that Adonis is with Daroka and hear that Shiro strangely calls him the boy that is loved by the goddess. Adonis wonders what Daroka is planning to do since he refuses to stop seeking revenge. Daroka just can't help trying to change our boy's rage-filled heart and comes up with a suggestion. She points out that there are nice humans like Mr. Punch and his crew, so she would like for Adonis to consider not fighting people like them. Nothing can change the cold-hearted Adonis though, so he refuses. He has allowed Daroka to accompany him, but makes it very clear that she cannot get in his way. Daroka gets the message loud and clear, so she keeps quiet. Adonis wants her to confirm that her love spell can make men fall in love with her so that she can control them. She confirms it, so Adonis wonders why she didn't use it on him. The first day they met in Redia, she could have used it so easily. He assumes that Ophelia ordered her to capture him by any means necessary, and using her spell would have been the most effective way. She didn't use any spells though, and tried convincing him instead. Daroka's answer is simple, Adonis wouldn't have liked their first meeting to go like that. Our boy dramatically drives off a cliff, but they somehow don't take any damage, and he thinks about how she is right. Their first meeting would have really sucked. The water from the puddle somehow turns into little fairy things, and Daroka reaches out to touch the little monsters. They arrive at some abandoned looking place called Sandland. The place is in ruins, so Daroka assumes that there is no one there. Adonis has Daroka stay there while he goes to look around, but she doesn't want to be left alone. Adonis just now notices that she has some white bag, and she explains that Mr. Punch gave her some essentials. Typical stuff you would take on a camping trip, including some cool little snowman tent. Daroka thinks it's all pretty neat, but our boy has stuff to do. The place really does look abandoned, and Daroka wonders if there are ghosts there. Adonis determines that there are no signs of fighting, even though there are broken windows everywhere, and he wonders why no one is there. The police station is also the biggest building in town, so Adonis hopes that they can find some information there. Daroka freaks out at the first sign of a mouse, but Adonis is not amused. She apologizes, but instantly embarrasses herself when she just keeps freaking out. Falling through the floor is just the cherry on top, and she apologizes again. Adonis warns her that he will leave her behind if she keeps being too noisy and they finally manage to make it to the second floor alive. Just then, some hologram thing asks if they need help, but Daroka of course freaks out again as she thinks it's a ghost. Adonis points out that it's a hologram, but Daroka says she has never heard of this person called Mr. Hologram. Adonis has to explain to this clueless girl that it's just a three-dimensional image and they move on. She apologizes to the hologram for some reason, but must rush off as Adonis is already leaving her behind. They continue exploring, but don't really find anything of interest. They eventually find some jail cells, and Adonis points out that they both have bad memories involving prisons. Adonis stops abruptly as he hears something and tells the pink-haired potato to be silent. Some guy seems to be singing and playing the guitar. 
It's a terribly sad love song, and our duo finds that a man is inside one of the cells. Daroka tries to get his attention, but it's no use. Adonis seems pretty disappointed by her effort, so the potato tries again, but this time adds a bit of bass to her voice. The rock star prisoner is startled and is shocked to see that strangers have come to see him. There should be no one left in the city, but Daroka explains that they are merely travelers passing through. The poor guy nearly had a heart attack, so Daroka has to apologize for the 10th time this episode. The guy wonders what they are doing there, as he can't believe that they are simply touring abandoned ruins. Adonis points out that it's even more strange that this guy is here all by himself, but this Johnny Depp looking guy says that he doesn't have a choice because he is a prisoner. That's a pretty valid reason, but we can see that there seems to be another person in the cell with him. Daroka wonders why Adonis is just leaving, but he explains that they have no business there and this place disgusts him. Discount Johnny Depp is amused by Adonis' statement, since that is what everyone said when they left the city. It all started after the gear expansion. They said humans couldn't live such old-fashioned lives now that the witches were wiped out. Everyone packed up all their big fantasies and got as far away from there as possible. He points out how in this age, people just follow whoever raises their voice first. Adonis doesn't really seem to be listening and simply wonders if there is a metropolis nearby. A city called Mamuda is 70 kilometers away, so Daroka apologizes one last time and they leave. Daroka is worried that the guy is going to starve to death, so she thinks that they should free him from prison. Adonis says it's none of their business, but Daroka seems to have forgotten that she isn't supposed to be getting in our boy's way. She wants to at least give the prisoner some of their food, but Adonis questions if the cell was even locked. Adonis figured out the truth, but he doesn't tell Daroka. He just says that the married couple in the cell don't need food. What they need is peace and quiet. Daroka had no clue there was another person in the cell, and we see that the man's wife already passed away. This poor guy has clearly lost his mind as he assures his wife that the strangers have left and he begins to sob. He sadly tells her that all the people that accused her of being a witch and locked her in the cell are all gone. He embraces the love of his life and tells her that from now on they will be together forever. He apologizes for not being able to protect her and we see that Daroka seems to have finally figured it out. Adonis determines that this town only needs room for the two prisoners, so it's time for them to start heading to Mamuda. Our pair travel through the desert and finally arrive at their plot-themed destination, Mamuda. They have to go through a very welcoming immigration gate and Daroka wonders if Adonis really plans to start a fight there. Our boy of course wants to fight everyone everywhere all the time, but Daroka fears that a big city like this one has a lot of soldiers and weapons. Adonis is so caught up in revenge that he doesn't understand her point and she is just worried that not even he will be able to survive. This absolute pink haired genius comes up with an idea and asks Adonis to play rock paper scissors. The loser will have to do something for the winner, but Adonis is done listening to this girl and declines. She keeps trying to press the issue, but instantly stops blabbering when they realize that Mamuda was created by men of culture. The place is also completely run down, and Adonis gets upset that this is just another place where he won't be able to get revenge on anything. They have to come to a screeching halt as a woman is on the road, but Adonis must tell the naive Daroka to be careful. She fears that this lady doesn't have much time left, and the woman says she must hurry. Daroka thinks that she is running from something, but Adonis realizes that she is not a person, and he tells Daroka to get away from her as fast as her stupid legs can take her. Daroka decides to just stand there instead, and the woman turns out to be some kind of robot. This machine does some kind of analysis on Daroka, and determines that she ranks low on the pleasure index. That's a pretty strange thing to happen, but this robot gets desperate, and decides that it needs pleasure regardless of who it comes from. Luckily, Adonis shoots it down before it can do whatever it was going to do and finishes it off with another bullet to its robot body. The robot depressingly meets its end and Adonis reveals that it was a Madoa, a mechanical doll that was created to be a plaything for humans. This anime takes a really strange turn as more of these dolls can be heard developing plot inside a building. Our boy thinks it would be best if he went to investigate and tells Daroka to just wait outside for some reason. Daroka wants to go with him but he gets pretty upset and tells her to stop acting without permission so he can check out all the plot development. He reminds her that he will leave her if she gets too annoying and tells her to scream if she needs him. Daroka patiently waits outside but is terrified when she sees that a whole bunch of these sad Madoa bots are piled up like trash. Adonis investigates the building using some light 
and we find that Daroka is really bad at listening since she followed him. She tries to tell herself that she has a good reason for disobeying him and explains that she promised Mr. Punch that she would keep Adonis out of trouble. She lies to herself as she thinks that Adonis wouldn't actually leave her in a place like this, but she quickly remembers that our boy just left her with a bunch of strangers. She convinces herself that Adonis wouldn't actually hurt her, but then remembers that he almost choked her to death. Just then, Adonis finds her and of course gets really upset. She doesn't seem to take him seriously, and he even begins to think that she is irritating him on purpose. Daroka gives him a whole speech on how they should be staying together. It would be safer and she has the bag with all their supplies. Surprisingly, Adonis agrees and just tells her to not get in his way. They continue investigating and approach a room that smells terrible and has a sound coming out of it that would get me banned on YouTube. For some strange reason that I will never be able to understand, they decide to go into the room. Inside, they find that these crazy robots have developed plot with someone until they died. The robots say that they just want to be loved and Adonis realizes that they have somehow developed a sense of self. They just can't stop developing plot with this corpse and they can't understand why they were created. Adonis has no answer for why they were created, but he does know why they need to be destroyed. He destroys them all and one of the robots sadly thanks him for putting an end to their sad existence. Elsewhere in the desert, two members of a special espionage unit quickly approach a checkpoint. These tatted up wannabe schoolgirls are annoyed by the readiest soldiers and decide to just charge right through them. They go by numbers so 5 tells 6 to get ready. 5 instantly takes out most of the soldiers and 6 does the cleanup work finishing off the last guy. Some other stupid soldiers think they are catching these girls off guard but they instead just end up as more corpses on the ground. These girls look at their handiwork and call the readiest soldiers pitiful. Adonis recalls how the witch overlord Ophelia once said that science reveals humankind's true nature. In a world where any toy can be created, it was only inevitable that some dude would invent plot developing robots. They find the same shackles that Daroka once wore at the Redian concentration camp and Adonis reveals that this nation offered their own women in exchange for these robots. Adonis apparently learned how to be a mechanic at some point as he works on a vehicle and explains that this city of Mamuda likely traded away all their women. All their daughters and wives exchanged for robots, so this just gives our revenge-filled protagonist more reasons to hate humans. Of course, this led to the nation's downfall since without women, the next generation cannot be born. This definitely isn't the only nation that has fallen in this way and it makes him sick. The two take some parts that Adonis took from the cars and head to the pile of robots. The genius mechanical engineer explains that he's making an improvised EMP, but the clueless Daroka has no clue what that is. Adonis puts it simply for her and explains that he is putting the pile of robots to rest. Daroka is of course concerned about the lifeless robots being hurt, but Adonis explains that they will only feel a small shock. He uses his written style summoning magic and has Daroka hold a speaker. Waves of EMP cover the robots and Daroka sees one of them thanking them. The dirty deed is done and Daroka is glad that Adonis is there with her. Up above, we see that the two dangerous schoolgirls were watching them and they realize that this guy is the man that is most wanted by the Redia Empire. He is the infamous witch's apprentice, but these chicks can't believe that he's just a teenager. Six tells five not to underestimate this boy though as he has given the Redia Empire considerable trouble. He slaughtered an unthinkable number of citizens and even annihilated the elite force that was sent after him. These two girls technically aren't allowed to deal with anything involving witches apparently. However, Six points out that some emperor named Suzere instructed them to capture anything that might help keep Redia in check. They hope that they will be rewarded if they succeed in their mission and wonder if they could even live in the capital. Six seems to have some kind of deep affection for the other number girl and explains that she will live anywhere as long as they are together. With that, they decide that it's time to confront the witch's apprentice. Number 6 instructs number 5 to take Adonis while she eliminates the girl, but 5 reminds her that she is the older one and is in charge. However, we see that Shiro has been watching them like a creep and smiles like one too. Adonis and Daroka finish up saving the world from the plot developing robot takeover and prepare to leave. The number sisters who are going after them however are confronted by Shiro. They demand to know who he is but the creep has no answer for them. To these girls, no answer means hostility, so they instantly attack. Back in Plot Town, we see that Daroka has made a grave for the Madoa and tells them to rest in peace in Robot Heaven. Our boy Adonis isn't delusional like her though and explains that offering condolences to them won't do any good. Creating graves and praying is simply a way for the living to cope, 
but doesn't do anything beyond that. Adonis jumps on this opportunity and explains that if she really wants to honor the Madoa, then she needs to do what he loves doing most. That is, to get revenge on the entire human race with a mass extinction. That's just a little too extreme for her though, so they just agree to disagree. Daroka then prays to a tombstone that she made for the witches, so Adonis thinks this would be a good place for her to just stay forever. She enjoys crying so much and there's tons of things to cry about in this city. Daroka somehow still can't believe he would say something so rude, but Adonis is never one to hold back for any reason. He reminds her that all her friends' lives were ended because he brought the humans to the moon base. She shouldn't even want to travel with him and this is her last chance to reconsider. This very serious and tense moment is interrupted when Daroka obviously doesn't care. She shows him that she found the two little dolls that Adonis rejected and he thought he got rid of those. Daroka explains that she simply doesn't want to blame him and doesn't want to argue anymore. She acknowledges that the witches were trying to use him. Their obsession with creating magical items to use against the humans led them to abducting Adonis. They tried to provoke him into reviving Chloe, so she realizes that this was practically a betrayal against him. Adonis decides that it's time for them to leave, and he shows that Daroka is continuing to change him little by little as he apologizes. He demands that she get rid of those stupid little dolls, but she's pretty proud of their miniature selves. Adonis wishes she was more skilled at something else, and she reveals that she can sing. Adonis isn't much of a fan of her singing, and just asks her not to do it while traveling. They are instantly shocked, however, as Shiro appears before them for the first time. He wants them to stop flirting so much as it's making him jealous. Adonis can instantly tell that he is an enemy and can't believe that they have already found them so quickly. Adonis prepares for a fight, but Shiro shows just how dangerous he is as he absolutely destroys their motorcycle, and we see that he eliminated the Number Sisters. Shiro introduces himself as someone that has a pretty big deal in Redia and reveals that he is there for their heads. Of course, Adonis doesn't have a single fearful bone in his body, and he is just glad that he finally found someone from Redia that he can kill. Thanks for watching my recap. Subscribe and ring the notification bell for future parts.